But I particularly want to center in this morning on the first one, and that is a loss of identity, because truly, if we're looking at our life, we're thinking basically it centers around kind of three things. One, it centers around our origin. Where are we from? Secondly, what's our purpose in life? What's our purpose? And thirdly, our destiny. Now, I can't imagine people wondering about their identity today, and of course they are, just like this guy on a motorcycle. You've probably seen this maybe in, uh, on social media, how he identifies as a cyclist as he wins the race on a motorcycle. And we have people today, women's sports are now under controversy, and uh, many decisions are being made there as well. And people are identifying as certain things, and maybe they're not that, but they're identifying as something else. There's a struggle, really, with who we are and a real identity in life and a real value that we put behind that as well. As we look at this passage in Genesis chapter 1, we said that in order to have maximum faith, that is when your faith really is in trouble, when your life is being tested, in order for us to really have maximum faith, we really need to believe in Genesis 1-1, the first 10 words of the Bible, which says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Without believing that, then the, the doubt and all the promises uh, in the Bible become in that doubt as we journey through life and we wonder, how can I trust anything else when I can't even trust the first verse or the first chapter of Genesis? In the last couple of weeks, we've looked at creation, and we looked at the six days of creation uh, two weeks ago, and I would invite you to go back on our website and watch those I think it'd be very valuable to you as you, you look at that. We're gonna, not going to look at the first six days of creation again, nor am I going to summarize them. I want to talk to you today about the crowning, the crowning of God's creation, and that's you, and the value that you really have in life. Now, you may be sitting there today, and you say, well, I, I just don't, I don't see that value in life, and truly, unless we b- believe that God created the heavens and the earth, we're going to have trouble, we're going to have trouble with that. I've shared with you before, Bertrand Russell, the uh, philosopher, a- atheist philosopher said, without the existence of God, there's no meaning to life. But here's another writer, Joseph Wood Crutch said this, there's no reason to suppose that man's own life has any more meaning than the life of the humblest insect that crawls from one annihilation to another. There was a, there's a story of one man tells, um, psychiatrist, a depressed woman came in to him uh, in, in his office, and he began to share with her, look, your, your life does have value. It does have worth. And he began to convince her that her life does have worth. And he began to share this then with his colleagues just over lunch. And they looked at him and said, how could you lie to a woman like that? How could you just lie to her? We need to help these people cope with the problems they have. There is no meaning to life. There is no worth to life. And he had a difficulty arguing with that because none of them believed in an eternal God. Now, here's the thing. Now, we fight sometimes not to believe. You know, the Bible says that God has innately put in our heart the knowledge of God. And we spend our lives sometimes not wanting to believe that. Why would we not want to believe that? Well, first of all, life's very complicated. All of our prayers are not answered with a yes, so we wonder about that. But also, we want to live our life sometimes any way we want to live it. We don't want to have to feel like we have to answer to someone. And then also answer to an an eternity, a destiny, you might say. We, We just want to believe when you're dead, you're dead. But the problem that comes with that is that then you take away any kind of purpose or any kind of meaning, any kind of value that you would have a worth to the rest of the world and even to your to yourself and to your family as well. But we want to look at Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at this passage, the creation, the crowning creation of God, around three words. Your worth, three words. One is design. We'll spend most of our time on that. The secondly is duty, what we've been called to do, our purpose. Thirdly is our destiny as we look at the third word, decision. Decision. So let's first of all, I want us to look at the word of God in chapter 1, verse 26. As we look at the design, it says, God said, let us make man in our image. Now, right there in the first uh, chapter of the Bible, we looked at this in the first week, let us means really points us to the Trinity of God, three persons in one, and I explained that in a message about three weeks ago. But notice this, it says, let us 
make man in our image after our likeness. Now, image and likeness, that's sort of similar terms, and they're used three times together in the Bible altogether, only three times. So what is the image of God? Surely that cannot mean physical, because the Bible says that uh, flesh and blood does not, have, does not inherit eternal life. The Bible says that uh, the, the, the God is spirit, and a spirit does not have flesh and bones. So how are you and I in the likeness or the image of God? First of all, spiritually, because God has given us the capacity to have a relationship with him. That's the original design. When he placed Adam and Eve in the garden, we'll find this in a couple of weeks, he placed him in the garden, he's walking through the garden. And so his design is for you and I to have a relationship with him and no other animal, no other creation Nothing else has ever been made in the image of God. He says he made the animals and it was good. And he blessed them, but he never, they were never in the image of God. And so we're in the image of God spiritually because even though an animal can work, only a human being can worship. We're there morally as well. Only a human being can make moral decisions in their life. We're in the image of God, uh, certainly mentally. As we can think, we can reason, we can discover truth in life, the way no insect or animal or fish or bird can do. And so we were made in the image of God. In fact, you were made kind of special yourself, weren't were you? I mean, after all, only you have the fingerprints that you, you possess. You, your fingerprints are yours and yours alone. Your DNA is yours and yours alone. God not only made human beings special, but he made you special and valuable within yourself. In fact, this traces all throughout the New Testament. Jesus said about the church, about you and I as individual Christians, he said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. All the way through the Bible, the thread runs there. But I want you to know something really, really special here that's special about you. I want you to skip ahead for just a moment in chapter 2. And I want you to look at seven and eight because in chapter two, what we find in chapter one, God says, this is our created man. And then he goes back in chapter two and he says, here's the detail. Here's the detail of the creation of man and then the creation of woman and how the family was started as well. But in verse seven, he says this, then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted him in the Garden of Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. He put him in paradise. He put him where in a place where he could uh, fellowship and have a relationship with him. But hey, I want you to know something really good here. And that is, the Bible says he formed man. How did he do that? He took the dust of the ground. Now we said in Genesis 1-1, the, word, the Hebrew word, the original word there for create was the word bara, which means to create something out of nothing. Here we find a different word. It's not really the word create, typically used. It's word for make something. He took some previously existing substance, the dust of the ground, the dirt, and he formed man. But he was not a living creature. He was not alive. He was just laying there, sitting there, standing there, whatever it was. But we'll just say laying there. Lifeless. How did he come to life? There, was, there had to be a stimulus to bring mankind to life. To bring Adam to life, what was it? It was, it says, he formed man, the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then, it says, he became a living soul or a living creature. The breath of God. Now, you think about that for just a moment. You and I were first came to life by the very breath of God. It reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 in the New Testament, where Paul said this. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. Now, many of your versions say, in fact, most of them do, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Well, that Greek word, theopneutos, means God breathed. God actually breathed the word of God. And that's why, one of the reasons why we believe the Bible is the perfect word of God and final authority in our life. How can God breathe error to us? Why would he breathe something and, and, and anoint something and inspire something that's going to hurt us? But this same concept, not the same word, because it's Greek versus Hebrew, 
But the same concept is used for your creation and mine. God was inspired. You are God's inspiration. Inspiration. He breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. That's how valuable we are to God. That's our worth to God. You're sitting here this morning and God has not only created you special, but of course Jesus died on the cross for you. We've said that so many times, maybe every Sunday since I've been here. But even in the book of Genesis where it all started, where it all began, he said, I've, you, you inspired. You were my inspiration. You were the crowning of my creation. But here it has ramifications as well, other things. And that is since your life is so valuable, human life being so valuable, it changes everything about it. When we believe that we're just the greatest animal, what happens? Well, murder goes up because we don't value human life. And we see that's going, that's going up all the time around the world, including our, our cities as well. You see crime going up. You know, now in some cities you can go into a, I don't know, a Best Buy or whatever, or whatever store, Target, Walmart, and, and just steal whatever you want to steal as long as it's less than $1,000 and walk out the door. I mean, pretty soon it's going to be a guy going into Best Buy and saying, look, this TV is just too big for me to, to steal out the door. Would you help me get somebody to help me with it? You know, <laughs> Just a thought. But that's what's happening. Why? Well, we're just the human animal. But here it says, all the way back to the book of Genesis, that in order for life to begin, it has to have a stimulus. How does a baby's life begin? It has to have a stimulus. It doesn't happen through the birth canal. It doesn't happen through the nourishment because it's, it's already growing. And then when it is birthed, there's no stimulus there. It's st just still growing. Where did the stimulus come from? It came from the seed of man. It came at conception. And, the, and science backs that up, but the word of God backs it up as well. Listen to what uh, the psalmist said in 139. For you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, listen, saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When it was as yet, there was none of them. We look at this and we say, well, life then has to begin at that conception. Why do we deny that? That's a scientific evidence of that. The science is on that side of things. Why do we de deny that? Well, if we're the human animal, we can go ahead and sacrifice that and, and therefore to have a, more, a better life ourselves. Now, look, I, I'm for women having the greatest life in the world. But you, you line up on, okay, is it the, the quality of life or the sanctity of life? Here in the Bible, all the way back to the book of Genesis, it says, look, there's got to be some kind of stimulus to start this. But, but we are in denial of that because many times in the world because of the things that we want to accomplish in life. And somebody argues, well, look, the babies don't even have capacity. Peter Singer, who was a Princeton uh, professor at the time he wrote this, I don't know about now, but at the time he wrote it, so basically what we're saying is, and the Supreme Court made the decision in 1973, they were saying that an, um, an unborn baby does not have capacity, no capacity to reason, no capacity to, to have any kind of input or any kind of benefit to the human world, can't make his decisions, on, can't live on their own. And he says that's true. So he was evidently for abortion. But he said this, he followed this and got really attacked for it, by the way. He said, if that's true then, the infant that was just born and is small and they're in the baby carriage, they don't have capacity either. They're not really contributing to life. They don't have their own ideas. They can't reason. And then if you're going to carry it further, he said, some severely mentally challenged people cannot live on their own and they can't reason. What about them? And what about the elderly? Listen, I have a relative right now that has Alzheimer's doesn't even hardly know me. What about that person who can't take care of themselves? And Peter Singer is just basically saying, if we cannot protect the unborn, we can't protect anybody based on capacity. But never mind that argument of the Supreme Court. Here we find life beginning 
early. And what about other things? What about civil rights? So, oh, now you're really getting political. Listen, let's leave politics out of the situation altogether. Don't you want your neighbor to have civil rights? Do I have any kind of amen out there at all? Don't you want your, your wife to have those civil rights? Don't you want your daughter that you're raising up to have those civil rights? Don't you want the, uh, the, the uh, Hispanic or the African American, your neighbor, the people that you work with, the people that you really like and they're for your friend? don't you want them to have civil rights? Did you know that's all found in the Bible? Dr. Martin Luther King, who's a pastor himself, looked in the book of Genesis and he said, there, there it is. It's not just certain groups are made in the image of God. All of mankind Every single human being is made in the image and the likeness of God and therefore has value and worth. Amen. So therefore, there it is in the Bible. Never mind the politics on either side of any of these issues. What's happening to our life is, is that when we leave God out of the equation, all of our beliefs begin to compromise and change. Here we find in the scripture the fact that God says human life is valuable. And you say, well, not me. I, I, just don't, uh, I just don't know if I have that much value or not. And, and some people have more, maybe more value than others, depending on how much they're maybe following Jesus. And I'll come to that in just a moment. But how many of you have ever seen uh, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Anybody here? You know, Jimmy Stewart playing that, that great part one of my favorite movies of all time. And he's saying, you know, I would be better off if I'd never lived. And then the angel, Clarence, shows him what life would be like without him. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered how many people's lives would not be touched if you were not here? You have value. You make a difference. And sometimes it's a negative difference. I know that. Some people do make a negative difference. But the Christian is valuable to God and makes a positive difference. Now, what, what do we do? We begin to compare ourselves. Why do we compare ourselves? Why do we, why do we have pride in who we are and put down this person and, and feel inferior to that one? Because basically, we're, we're going to only admit uh, the weaknesses that we have in our life that we can bear to admit. We can only go so far. But here's what it says in 2 Corinthians. Not that you were to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one, one another, they were without understanding. So what do we do? Well, why should I give my life to Christ, as one young man said one time at, at uh, a church there in Georgia. Why should I do that? Look what God did to me the first time. And so you compare your looks with someone else. You're not as good looking. You're, you, maybe not, you don't think yourself is as beautiful. You're not the ladies' man. You're, you're not the one everybody wants to ask out for a date. You're not the smartest person. You're not athletic enough, but you're more athletic than this guy. And, and then you begin to compare yourself on other notes. Hey, spiritually speaking, maybe I'm not what I need to be, but I'm better than you. And maybe I'm not as good as you, but I'm not going to even think about you. I'm going to think about this guy over here. We be, begin to compare ourselves with one another. And so what really is happening to our life? We are being formed, not under the image of God, but the image of other people. In fact, one psychologist plain out just said, we are the product of all of our relationships. And if, if you are living outside the word of God, I would say that's so. Let me give you an example. Many of you are younger than me. A few of you are not. I'll just let me throw that out. But how many of you here remember the late 60s or 70s, or you've seen movies about it? Okay, anybody here? Okay. Now, that was the hippie movement. And we can talk about today about Marxism and things like that, but it was, it was popular back in the 60s. You know, the people with the long hair, long beards, you know, the drug culture, the sex culture, sexual revolution, uh, the rebellion, the, the, the protests against the Vietnam War. We can go on and on and on. The dropouts. I mean, I can remember one song uh, done by, uh, uh, sung by a uh, group called the Guess Who. And if I can remember a little bit of the ly lyrics, uh, maybe you can just take my hand. Maybe we can share the land. Hey, we'll just simply give it away and we'll all live together. Doesn't that sound like some things going on today? And so all that came through the 70s and all of a sudden a switch turned. I don't know if Michael J. Fox on Family Ties caused it or not or if he was just a, a, a product of it. 
But all of a sudden, the hippie turned into the yuppie. Remember the yuppies? And what was that all about? It was all about materialism. You know, you heard the old joke about the guy, the yuppie getting in a car accident, and, he, and the, the paramedics are coming out, bringing him out of the car, and he says, oh, my Beamer, my Beamer. You know, a BMW. My Beamer. And they said, never mind your car, man. Your, your arm is severed from the elbow down. And he looks at it, and he says, oh, my Rolex watch, my Rolex watch. Okay, it wasn't that funny. But it was in the 80s when all that was happening. Now, here's my point. What would cause all that change? You say, well, you know, the hippies just uh, hipped right back in, right? No, no, they, they never really changed that much. They, a lot of them dropped back in, and, and they became professors at universities and things like that. They did. But a new generation came along, also, also influenced by their peers and their relationships, and they had a totally different feel on life altogether. And it, it was like a group that was coming in. It wasn't that, okay, this guy's, this guy's a hippie and this guy's a yuppie and this guy's somewhere in between. He had the hippies in one generation, the yuppies in another. Why? Because we're formed, since we don't want to be rejected, we don't want to be canceled out. We are formed by those relationships around us as we want to be accepted. And it's easier to be accepted when you are, suddenly you start really believing, really believing, I mean, you're a true believer, on the things that are going on around you in the lives of other people, your friends. But salvation is not so. Salvation is to get us back to God's original design. And that is to be in his image in order to have a relationship with him. We look at this and understand not only do we, we get this through design, but we get it through duty as well. I, I'm gonna go over this very quickly. It says in verse 26, after our likeness, let them have dominion, a rulership, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and all over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them and blessed them. And, and he, said, he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that creeps on the earth, moves on the earth. Now, you can look down this passage all the way through verse 31, and God is really kind of, kind of saturating things. And he's saying, you, your dominion over everything this is your stewardship. We keep coming back to, I know that word, but the stewardship, a manager of another's household or possessions, God owns it all, and God says, look, I'm, Adam, I'm giving you the Garden of Eden. We find that in verse uh, 15 of chapter two. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Look, this, this is your rock. You've got a piece of the rock. This is your stewardship. You subdue this. You have dominion over this, and God has the same kind of stewardship for us as well. It's a family. It's a ministry. It's a work. Yeah, it's money too. It's all those things, and one day, it, it, the thread runs all the way through the Bible, all the way to the judgment seat of Christ, because the only thing that you and I are going to be judged for as believers, since our sins are already been covered by the cross, by the blood of Jesus, the only thing we're going to be judged for is what we did with our stewardship. Now, this is what I gave you. What did you do with it? That's it. All the way through the Bible. There's something about a duty, something about a calling that fulfills our life. There's more to life than the story I heard about a couple that moved down from the north and they, they wanted to retire in Florida. And he wanted, just wanted to play golf every day and she wanted to collect seashells. And all of a sudden they woke up one day and say, you know, how many more golf games do I have left? How many more different types of seashells are they there in, on the beach in Florida? Not much purpose. We find our purpose in the calling that God has for our life. But without, without the design, you're coming back to the image of God. Because the very, listen, the very moment that you're saved, what happens? The Spirit of God comes to live inside your heart. And the Bible says, whom he did foreknow, he also did preplan that they would be conformed to what? The image of Jesus Christ. That's all the way in the New Testament. Paul wrote that thousands of years later. And he says right here, all the way back to the book of Genesis, you're created in the image of God. 
Jesus Christ coming into your heart is to get you back to the image of God. And as you have a relationship with him, God calls you to what is going to fulfill you in life and where you can really make the difference, the impact, the supreme worth, the supreme value of life and your life. But then we have a decision, don't we? Life is just filled with decisions. Look in verse 16 of chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you shall surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you, you eat of it, you will surely die. Now he's saying to us, and say, said to Adam, look, this is more than a test. It's a decision. The fact that we are free moral agents, according to the book of Genesis, and we can make choices in our life on following God each and every day of our life, really, but particularly for salvation, but then every day of our life after that is part of the definition of just being human. The animals, the fish, the fowls of the air, the birds, they will not make decisions on whether they're going to follow Jesus or not. They're not going to make spiritual decisions in their life. Only us, only those made in the image of his son, an image of God, have that. Now, here, here God has a, has a kingdom. The kingdom has rules. And he makes one rule, just one. There's no Ten Commandments here. There's no need for that because there's no sinful nature so far. So there's no tendency to do things in the wrong way. He says, look, I'm just going to give you one test. I'm going to put one tree in the, in the garden, a, a tree of good and evil, of knowledge. And when you eat of that tree, of course, you're going to know not just what's good, you already know that, but you're going to know what's evil. And you're going to know it in a personal way, experiential way. And he says, that same day you're going to die. Now, you say, well, there's a contradiction here in the Bible because you can read in chapter 3, they didn't die then. They lived many, many years. They had a lot of kids. But they died spiritually. The image of God was marred, didn't, didn't kill it off, but it was marred by sin. And the Bible says that we are all born of Adam, and sin entered the world by Adam, Romans chapter 5, and he says, and death by sin, and he says, for all have sinned. The sinful nature of Adam was imputed and put into our life when we're born. We come into this world, and therefore, we come to a place in our life where we know good and evil. We know right from wrong. We're, we, we are morally responsible at some age. We don't know exactly. It's different with everybody, but at some age. And at that point, we begin to choose to sin and choose to do the wrong thing. A free moral agent is the essence, really, of being a human being so we can decide to be in the image of God. Now, that begins with salvation. It's true. I mean, the very moment that you come to know Christ, God begins that redesign in your life over and over and over again. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't stop there. Let me give you an example. Suppose somebody here, uh, maybe one of our college graduates, uh, you know, got a job, and it was a perfect job, just right. I mean, it's, it's what you've been dreaming about all this time, and it it's fits right into your major, and you think to yourself, wow, I can make a lot of money in this. There's all kinds of potential. And you just can't wipe the grin off your face. But you know, you still have to go to work. You, have to, you still have to grow into that job. You have to take all the benefits of that job. And you have to get promoted in that job. But the potential is there. When you and I receive Jesus Christ, the potential becomes there. We begin at that point, not only forgiven of all of our sins, and our tickets punched to heaven... But we begin a journey with God, of walking with God as though we were walking with him in the garden. And as we do, we grow. Things come into our life, temptations, and, and different things come into our life. And we think, oh, I need to change that. I need to change that. God's moving in my heart to do this, this, or this. And we begin to slowly change over a period of years. More and more getting back to the original design that God has for us. Ephesians puts it this way. Long ago, before he made the world, God chose, to, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. 
We were stand before him covered with his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because he wanted to. He wanted to. How valuable are you to God? He wanted to. He wanted to come and die on the cross for you. How valuable are you to God? Well, I, I tell you how valuable. He wants to keep you around forever. That's how valuable you are to God. That's your worth. He wants to keep you around close to him forever and forever. So he sent Christ to die on the cross for your sins and mine. You see, the, the world, those outside of Christ cannot know this. In a book called How Now Shall We Live, which I think is one of the great books written in the last 25, 30 years, written by Chuck Colson, who's gone on to be with the Lord now. But Chuck Colson was of Watergate fame. And um, he was put in prison. And, and while he was in prison, or right before prison, right around that time, uh, he was saved. He had a book out called Born Again. And then he wrote other books as well. He started Prison Fellowship. And he, he saw that, that prison was an opportunity for so many people to come to know Christ. And prison needed to be reformed. And he went through all that. And that ministry is still going on. Uh, today. I knew his pastor uh, before he passed away. I had a chance to meet him a couple of times. And he tells a story about Richard Nixon's funeral. Now, this is long after Chuck Colson had been saved. But he goes to his funeral, and he said, you know, you, you can just imagine it's in the, the Nixon Library uh, courtyard. And all these hundreds of people looking around. They're, they're marching right behind the pallbearers are with the casket. Others are right behind the casket. And others are watching to the side. And he looks up as the pastor is about ready to say something. He said, standing before me are the most important, some of the most important people in all the world. And here we are, standing here, staring at a coffin. And he said, this is the picture of no hope in the world. Just simply staring at a dead person, looking toward dying themselves, not forward, but toward it. And he's being lowered into the ground. That's all there is. But that's really not all there is. God loves you enough so much he designed you in a certain way. He breathed into you the breath of life. And now he wants to help you grow as a believer after you trust him at the cross. You see, it's not you trust him as your Savior and Lord, but then you trust him every day of your life. Put your weight upon him every day of your life in the different situations of life. And you've got the power to do that because God's spirit lives in your heart. Now, you're sitting here this morning as a believer. I want to challenge you. There's something in your life. You say, oh, no, no, I'm good right now. Well, if you're good right now, you just dealt with something this week. But chances are there's something in your life you think, God, I need to surrender this part of my life to you. Would you grapple with that? Would you do that? Would you just trust God? Would you lean and trust God, put your weight upon him for that? And then there's others here that you've never received Christ. Maybe you're a church member. Maybe you belong to another church. Maybe you've been baptized. You've been sprinkled. You've been poured on. You've been dipped. But all along, you're trusting in something that you're doing, hoping that it'll be enough. It's never enough. It's never enough because it's not a question of doing better or being reformed. It's a, it's a point of being transformed. As Chuck Colson would say, and the Bible would say, born again. Have you ever done that? Have you ever really truly trusted Christ and tr Christ alone to save you? If not, you need to do that today. You need to get started getting back to the image of his son. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never made that decision or you feel like you've prayed and prayed but nothing's really happened to your life, you've never really made that total surrender to Christ, never really trusted him totally, to save you, always relying maybe on something else that you're doing. Would you trust Christ today? You can do that by praying this prayer with me. And you can pray it silently here. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it, of course, at home. If you're at home, you're watching, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. And if you really mean 
this prayer. Jesus will come to live inside your heart through his spirit. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for your love, for your design, for breathing into me the breath of life that I'm your inspiration. But God, the image has been messed up by sin and I confess my sin to you. I know that there's nothing I can do to get forgiveness on my own. And that's why I come to the cross. I come to Jesus. And I place all my weight upon you for salvation. So come into my heart, Lord Jesus, right now, right now, and save me forever. In Jesus' name, amen.